My name's Mary Amelias. I'm a GP and psychotherapist working at a Headspace site in Cairns. I've realised that my web, my internet connection is getting me the information about four seconds slower than everybody else on the video. Um, but that should not make any difference. Um, this webinar is brought to you by the Mental Health Professionals Network. And um, we're very pleased tonight also to be uh, partnering with the Private Mental Health Alliance for this um, webinar. So we would like to gratefully acknowledge their support. The Private Mental Health Alliance has a vision for a mental health system that addresses the need for consumers and carers to have a robust between providers of mental health services in the private sector. And that's mostly where our nearly 300 participants tonight um, are working. Welcome everybody. And so we, there's all sorts of vagaries in the system which make working together difficult. So the Mental Health Professionals Network was set up to try to help address that and promote collaboration. And we have a lot of principles in common with the Private Mental Health Alliance. Um, there's some very clever minds in that organisation who spent um, a lot of time and energy developing a document talking about the principles of collaboration, which I'd really encourage you to read. Um, there is, it covers all sorts of things, so things like shared decision making, continuity of care, talking about who is the coordinator in a case, um, how, how we speak about other professionals with our clients, um, how does the GP mental health treatment plan fit in, how do we send feedback, how do we best use a psychiatrist in the team, um, and all kinds of things like that. So I think it's very practical and will be a good follow-on from this um, webinar tonight. And hopefully the, the case discussion with the panellists, who I'll introduce to you in a moment, will give you a good example of how this collaboration can work together. So I'd like to um, introduce our panellists tonight. Carolyn Johnson is a general practitioner who has many interests and uh, did help to develop the principles document with the Private Mental Health Alliance. Carolyn, I can see that you've had um, a lot of experience in primary mental health care research. And I wondered if there was, what would be, in a few seconds, the most interesting piece of research that you've uh, been involved in? I guess most interesting for me was um, uh, interviewing consumers and carers and GPs about how they monitored depression in the primary care setting um, and just learning about the, um, the um, potential um, clash between the technical processes involved in monitoring and the relational processes involved in that task. It does sound really interesting. Thank you and welcome to the panel. Um, Jan, you're the um, consumer rep on our panel tonight and I can see that you've actually been involved in consumer advocacy in a, in a, a number of different organisations in Australia, including things like the Mental Health Council of Australia, and chairing some committees for the um, RANZCP, the College of Psychiatrists. So yeah. I just wonder if you wanted to give us a comment on, on your involvement with the uh, College of Psychiatrists. Where, oh. how, you know, I think that would be a really fascinating thing to do. Yes, look, I've been involved uh, over the last um, several years with various aspects of the RANZ CP uh, providing a consumer or a, an Australian um, community perspective on a number of issues that have been uh, raised there and also been part of the internal review process um, and currently sit on the Members Advisory Committee. Thank you. So that's a representing actually um, our, our community in a really important role. So we're really pleased to have a psychiatrist on the panel. I can that you also have had a, a lot of different um, involvements as well as your clinical practice. Um, and I wondered if you wanted to just give us a very, uh, I noticed that you've had a lot of experience in consultant liaison psychiatry and I'm not sure that everyone will really have a understanding of what that is. If you could give us a few seconds on that. Yes, very briefly. Uh, it, it's uh, probably may be understood more easily as general hospital psychiatry or uh, it's moved into the community a lot more in recent years. But um, basically I suppose the, the issue in terms of collaboration is uh, having to 
link in with different teams at different times uh, in, in a hospital setting when people are suffering physical illness but also suffering mental health issues and difficulties and having to go from one team to another team, different teams having different cultures uh, and so forth, and having to adapt and uh, work in with the team to get the best results for the patient. Uh, that's, that's probably my best uh, backgrounding in terms of collaboration, I suppose. Thanks very much, Bill, and welcome to the panel. And last but not least, um, I'd like to introduce Louisa, who's um, a psychologist in Melbourne now. Uh, Louisa, you have a specific interest and experience and a uh, doctorate in health psychology. Could you just briefly explain um, in a few words about health psychology? Sure. Um, health psychology is a uh, particular area of psychology that's interested in the connection between um, mental health and physical health. So we do a lot of work around supporting people uh, that maybe have been diagnosed with something like cancer or MS, uh, maybe they've got chronic pain. And then we can also spend time helping people to make, um, using I guess psychological strategies to help them make um, healthy lifestyle changes, lose weight, exercise more, reduce stress. Um, that kind of thing. Thank you very much, Louisa. And I'm sorry I got them in the wrong order from the slides. Now I am. I've got a message to say that my internet connection is lost, so I don't know whether you can see any or not. So if the slides don't advance, someone else might need to do that until this is solved. Um, so tonight we're going to just be using the webinar platform, which is, has some. Um, you know, it's a complex platform and things can happen. So there's, it's important that we just remember that um, we are in a bit, we need to rem remember that there are 350 of us or so now talking together. So as if this were a face-to-face -face activity. So if you'd like to type comments to other participants in the general chat box at the bottom, please go ahead, just keeping in mind that um, everyone can see that. And if you um, would like to post questions for the, pan the panel, please do post them in that box. And um, if you need help with technical issues, post them in the technical chat box. Um, and so I would like um, to just quickly revisit our learning objectives as well. So by the end of this evening's um, webinar, we hope that we will be able to think um, more clearly about how we collaborate together. So to recognise the need for appropriate collaboration, effective communication, and where required to share care. Um, to be able to identify the challenges to and opportunities for collaboration um, that may emerge as the practitioners from the disciplines featured on the panel work together to support PASI and to explore key principles for effective collaboration, communication and cooperation between mental health practitioners. Now I'd just like to um, remind all the participants this evening that what we're trying to do is have a real discussion between people who've thought a lot about these issues. We're not trying to actually solve everything in Cathy's case. And as we can see from the situation of a 21-year-old woman with a number of complexities and other people involved in her life and interested in her well-being, we're not going to solve it all in an hour and a half. So if you feel that a point of yours is not being heard or something's being missed, please uh, remember that in real life we would be working these things out over time together. So just uh, everyone will have seen the case beforehand and uh, so Kathy is a 21 year old young lady and initially she comes in brought in by her mum. Now there was one key point that I just really wanted to raise at the beginning which often comes up in the webinars about young people. We get a lot of questions from the participants about how to engage a reluctant adolescent. So if our panellists can keep in mind if you want to offer any practical tips about that on the way, that is something that, that um, everyone wonders about or some people figure it out and other people just find it really difficult. And in this case, Cassie doesn't want to be there. She's sullen, she's uncommunicative, she's 21, her mum brought her in. Um, so I think the person who first gets to respond to Cassie is our general practitioner. So on that note, I'd like to hand over to Carolyn to discuss. Um, your response to Cathy. Thanks, Carolyn. Thank you. Well, I guess my, my first response is to 
remind everyone that most appointments in general practice, if you're lucky, are 15 minutes long unless someone's given you advance notice that they might need more time and it's a particularly difficult situation when someone's not necessarily engaged in care to get them engaged in like this is, are they safe? You know, not just risk of suicide but risk of self-harm but um, we know patients like this who present general practice have risk of other things, particularly risk of their physical health. So in this person it might be risk of sexually transmitted infections or um, pregnancy or all kinds of other things. So sometimes it's 15 minutes I was establishing before I had to check the patient's case and that's difficult if you haven't established before. The other thing that's very frustrating is knowing that you have some skills to make a mental health assessment because like most GPs as part of the general practice curriculum, not a specialist training. I've learned how to do a mental health assessment but I might not be able to do it properly in 15 minutes but also recognising that this person needs to access care and she's sort of engaged in accepting a referral so I don't want to lose that one opportunity. Um, that's the rest of me to a bit about my duty to care to make it properly to make it then the psychologist to this potentially flawed. I mean, maybe she needs to see um, a psychiatrist in our practice trying to establish or maybe she needs to spend more time with mental health and there are other allied health professionals that would also help her. So uh, in, in particular that she might need um, not only psychotherapy but medication now. to her family who I know because I'm their family doctor um, and I want to make sure that I, um, I guess on, honestly I want to make sure that I don't lose faith with them or let them down and that's a real tension in general practice. It's one of the great rewards of general practice of course and it's a great opportunity to help people because we do know the family setting but by the same token sometimes it can make us, it hard for people to engage with us because they're not sure of you know, how we will deal with confidentiality. And then the last thought I'm having um, immediately is what about my duty of care to the patients who are backing up in the waiting room because we know in general practice we take all comers with all kinds of problems and we see a lot of people with mental health problems and they have the equal right to care as people with physical health problems but clearly I'm going to have to manage the time for the rest of the day and hope that my other patients are understanding. I guess the next thing I just want to quickly say is what I would hope you'd see is a friendly whinge from, from GPs. A mental health treatment plan is not just a referral and in fact to meet even uh, a portion of the requirements of the mental health treatment plan um, the GP is required to spend at least half an hour with a patient so if they come in with a 15 minute appointment you're already behind the eight ball just assuming you're going to be able to complete the template right away. Um, and this kind of is a challenge for us in general practice because we value the fact that we're the gatekeeper. We know that um, healthcare is very expensive and our role is to make sure we can still to people to the right place at the right time. That's not just important from an affordability point of view for the healthcare system but it's also important from a safety point of view so that someone who might need a particular type of care gets it from the right person. And unfortunately, um, the other thing I'm thinking in my waiting moment is um, how many silos there are to look at how this case unfolds. The fact that there's lots of people who can help, there's lots of people in allied health and in medicine and psychiatry who would be great at helping with this problem. But it's very unlikely that I'll be able to get them to work together in a cooperative way. It's much more likely that I'll have a few false start before I can get this person engaged. And again, that's pretty much how this case plays out. Um, so just to finish up my last few comments. Um, I guess this isn't really my wish list or my vision for where I'd hope we would head with this. I'd want to introduce the notion of what we call the medical home, which is a place in the community where people can get of um, primary care from prevention to early intervention. Not only treatment, because we need a lot of help getting treatment, but that issue then of ongoing monitoring and relapse prevention. And, and that really does happen after an episode of care, and it's very hard to coordinate in general practice with people providing their outside the medical home so communicate with us effectively. Um, I have a vision for, for other providers being really welcome into the medical home and that we can um, trust and trust each other enough to be able to focus on the patient's needs and not just on, on the business model of each provider or their, or their reputation. Um, 
And I guess this slide about being the elephant in the room, I suspect we all sometimes feel like the elephant in the room that we're doing. It's hard, we're trying to help people, but we don't really know what other people think of how we're working together. And I think this is particularly an issue for carers. I mean, certainly my work in talking to carers made me really clear about how they often have a lot of great ideas how to help people, but they don't get a voice. And finally, my vision is that whatever we do, that it's focused on recovery and that we somehow have a shared understanding of what we really mean by recovery, because my experience in general practice, everybody has a slightly different perception of that and we need a bit more transparency about conversations about recovery. Thanks very much, Thanks Carolyn. Very much, Carolyn. Just, um, just, um, the, sound the sound through your headset has been breaking up and the, pa the participants are can't, it's coming in and out. So we were wondering whether you might be able to just use a handset. Yep. I'm not sure whether that's possible, but perhaps you could have a look at that while while we go on through the other panelists. Yep. Um, got clearer thank if you I very that. much. Thanks, Carolyn. Okay, thank you. Um, and we will um, have some in discussions. I'm sure that there's going to be lots of practical issues. So I think um, Carolyn's dream about uh, the medical home would be an ideal situation and we know that that a number of there are a lot of things in our system that that can make that quite difficult and it, I think that our fragmented funding system in mental health care in the private sector makes it really hard to do sharing care when things are fragmented in our system but anyway maybe that means we have to change the system now um Louisa, I'd like to invite you to respond now. If, uh, if Cathy was referred to you, what um, what kinds of things would you be thinking about when you first met her? Sure. Thanks. So I just wanted to start by just giving a quick bit of background about my thoughts around collaboration and what I think it is and when I think it's important. And then I'm going to talk about what I would do with Cathy in particular. So I guess first of all in terms of what collaboration is, to me collaboration it's about more than providing feedback. It's not just about the psychologist writing the uh, reports that Medicare ask us to do. It's about joint problem solving. Um, so getting together with the other people on the team and thinking, okay, I'm a bit stuck with um, Cathy, I'm not sure what to do here and there. What do you think? This is what I was thinking. Am I missing something? So it's about us doing that together, me not holding it all on my shoulders. Um, Louisa, can I yes. just ask you to move your microphone a little closer to your mouth? Is that Absolutely. Yep. Thank you. Beautiful. Is that better? Yeah, great. I might great. Just hold it at the same time. Um, and so it's about taking time so that we're all on the same page. I think this is so, so important um, that um, that we know where, I know what the GP is thinking and that they know where I'm coming from with certain issues and a psychiatrist and family members so that we're just all, we're all on the same page. I think that. Um, that is going to be the best way for us to be able to give the best possible care to our, um, our clients. So when to collaborate, to me the sorts of things I'm thinking when I'm working with patients is it's if I've got an idea about how I can assist another member of the treatment team. So the client might have told me something about one of the other members and I think actually I've got an idea that might help them with this. So that's when I would be picking up the phone. Um, I'd also be thinking about collaborating when I need help from the team, when I'm getting stuck with someone, when I'm not sure what to do, that's when I pick up the phone and say, look, what do you think about this? Um, and something that I often say to my um, the psychologists in my team is if you're trying to write one of those Medicare reports and it's taking you ages and you're kind of going around in circles worrying about offending or worrying about how you're writing something, that to me is a really good sign that it's time to just pick up the telephone and it's too complex for those reports. I think to me those reports are quite um, quite simple about giving feedback. Um, I think there are lots of barriers to um, collaboration and I think it's really great if um, we as therapists can think about what those barriers might be. I think one of them that I hear a lot is about time and we're all so busy um, and especially GPs. I know that um, as a psychologist we worry that maybe we're uh, being a bit of a pain by calling and trying to talk. Um, to the GP or the psychiatrist and especially when we have a bit of telephone tag, you think, oh, maybe it's just not worth it. Is what I'm going to say actually that important? Um, also that we're, we might be anxious. Um, so, you know, what if the GP thinks that I'm um, incompetent or I don't know what I'm doing? Um, what if I've got nothing really that relevant to say? Um, and also sometimes the mindset of I should be able to fix this on my own. The GP has referred this person to me and I should be able to do this. And I really try to um, 
try to be aware of that um, of that thought if it pops into my mind and remind myself that this is meant to be collaboration. We're all meant to be doing it together. I don't have to um, do this on my own. Um, and so before I get into my particular thoughts around Cassie, I've got four tips for collaborative communication that I think might be helpful. Um, one is for our psychs to be communicating our formulation without jargon. Um, just go simple, go casual. Um, I think that the I think that the other people in the in the team really appreciate that because when they just get that simple understanding, a simple insight um, about their patient, I think they're really thankful for that. Um, second tip: asking for an opinion. So look, you know, this is my formulation. What do you think? Am I on track? Is there anything that I've missed? Giving and taking. So um, giving advice. Yep. Um, you know, this would be really helpful if you would be able to do this when you next see the patient when they come into the consultation. Can you reinforce this issue or whatever it might be? And taking as well, asking them, what can I do? What's going to help you do your job with the patient? What do you need me to do when I'm seeing um, the client? And I'd also say about keeping to time. So just being careful to be succinct. Um, and that way, hopefully, the other people in the team will have a positive experience and they'll be more likely to take your call next time. So in terms of Cassie in particular, first of all I guess I'm thinking that I'm confronted with this ethical dilemma about um, the father and what um, what he's, um, you know, how to deal with him. It's complex in my head. I'm thinking like I need to be transparent with Cassie and I don't want to keep secrets from her. Uh, but on the other hand, and I'm thinking I want to engage the family as well and they're just, they're going to be far more worried about her than I am. Um, so I am thinking to myself, how am I going to deal with this? And I'm probably going to get stuck, so I'm probably going to pick up the phone and want to nut this out with other people on the team um, and probably you know, the GP. My mind is probably going to be telling me things um, like I should be able to solve this on my own. They're going to think that I'm incompetent. This is an ethical dilemma and I should know what, you know, I should know what to do. I'd sort this out myself, but I'd be pushing uh, you know, against that and, and picking up the phone anyway. Um, in terms of um, picking up um, those signs of the um, a mental state, uh, maybe with questions of bipolar, I'd be considering a psychiatric assessment and I'd probably be in particular thinking about the um, item 291 um, where a psychiatrist can um, do a, a consultation and report um, and then I'd, I'd be wanting to find out from the psychiatrist, do you want my feedback beforehand, afterwards um, and and then I'd be thinking about, okay, after that report, what advice can I get? Can we get from the psychiatrist? How can what what they've um, assessed um, help us with what to do with Cassie? Um, and then that I'd be picking up the phone and saying to the GP, look, this is what I'm thinking. What do you think? Because ultimately they're the ones that are going to do the referral. But again, it'd be I've got this client. This is what I'm thinking. What do you think? Um, in terms of um, you know, I guess another issue is how am I actually going to pick up the phone? Psychologists might be thinking, you know, I don't want to pick up the phone. They too busy, I'm too busy. Um, I've got a few little strategies about how to make that collaboration a bit easier. Um, one is that with the GPs that I've got good relationships with, I'll get their email address. I'll have a bit of an email back and forth about the best time. So we're setting that up and we're not wasting our time passing messages backwards and forwards. That reduces that phone tag, which can get annoying. And I also use my receptionist and say to my receptionist, look, can you call the GP clinic, find out when they're free, find out a good time and hook it up for us and that way the actual health professionals aren't using as much of their valuable time. Um, I'm also thinking about Cassie and the fact that she's asked for no written information to be sent and um, really I'd be thinking about exploring that more with her. I wouldn't just be letting that go and I'd be talking with her about what her worries were about that and trying to get it on board with the collaborative process. Um, I'd be talking about the fact that under better access we really do need to give at least some feedback back to the GP. But I'd be encouraging or I'd be reassuring her that um, that she's involved in that process and probably with someone like her I'd be giving that GP report, giving a copy of that to her as well so that she knew exactly what was being said. I think that transparency is very important um, with younger people um, and particularly when family members are involved like Cassie's family are very involved in this so I think it would be very, very important that she feels that she's a client and we're being very transparent with her. Um, and if, if she said no, definitely don't want you to talk to the GP. I'd at least be trying to get, get permission to explain that to the GP. So the GP knew where I was coming from. So they weren't thinking, oh, you know, what's this psychologist doing? She's not giving me any feedback. Um, or is she deteriorating? Is, you know, is the psychologist actually looking after her properly? So I'd be letting 
the GP know, look, it's a bit hard, I'm not really able to give you much feedback because he's worried, but I am working on it. Um, um, I would, um, I'm also thinking that I'd be wanting to communicate that formulation to the psychiatrist um, and any points that might help in particular. So I'd probably be asking, like, you know, um, how might I, you know, explore the issue of the, the trauma around the rape with her? Should I do it now? Should I do it later? What's your opinion? So I'd be really getting their advice. And again, I'd be doing it over the phone. I'm a believer in doing that over the phone. I think it's um, quick and it's efficient. Um, and if a client stops coming after three sessions, um, without reaching her goals, again, I'd be contacting the GP to let them know. Um, again, I'd probably call the GP because I'm thinking it's more than just feedback. It's more than just saying, look, she's dropped out. But it's about saying, look, this is my insight. I think this is why Cassie has dropped out. And I think she got uncomfortable when I raised this issue about the rape and about going there or whatever it might be. And so perhaps when you see her again, you know, reassure her that it's okay, that we don't have to do that. Or, or uh, maybe I'd be thinking, maybe she's not comfortable with me. Um, so you know, when she comes back to see you, talk with her about other options, and that's okay. okay that kind of thing. That's it. Thank you very much, Louisa. Um, really practical tip, which I know people appreciate. Um, now I'd just like to invite Bill. So Bill has now um, received the referral from the GP. Um, so Bill, tell us about how you would think about Cathy. Thank you. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I guess uh, just a couple of things in. Uh, what I've put up for people to see was uh, that uh, I felt that collaboration um, isn't uh, something you can legislate for. It's something that probably builds over time through mutual respect, working together in some way. Um, I think it's worth trying to listen out. I think I believe everyone has something to contribute. They're seeing a particular angle of what's happening to the person, and uh, it's worth trying to listen out for that special. Uh, a bit of information or angle on how to deal with things that every participant in the team um, uh, has uh, to offer. Uh, I think it's probably worth mentioning that it's uh, possible for us to harm people by going off in different directions, telling the patient different things, uh, or that person's no good to work with, or whatever it is, without actually dealing with that person face to face and saying, I don't think you, you should be dealing with this patient. Uh, even if, it's, if that's the doctor, whatever it is, you know, I think we should be sorting those things out amongst ourselves um, rather than put it, making the patient a meat and a sandwich. There. And you can harm some people by doing that. Um, and Bill, I, can you just move the telephone mouthpiece a bit closer? Thank right, you. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> and Thank um, you. I guess uh, this sort of person, Cassie, that we're looking at in this case, I know it's a theoretical case, in a way, it's probably based on someone real. Um, uh, there's so much uncertainty that she generates in a way that this, these are the, the very people that it's hard for the team to remain uh, collaborating and working well together around. And so I thought she was a very good case from that point of view. Uh, it's a matter of having enough strength or glue in the relationships in the teams um, uh, to be able to keep contacting each other in the face of the uncertainty that the patients have brought up before us. Um, then um, I've, I've also um, uh, wanted to mention uh, about the tools that we might have. Obviously communication lines and Louisa has, um, <coughs> has mentioned uh, that. I think sometimes um, doctors are hard to get through to, the, the psychiatrist and the GP. Um, they feel as though they're very busy. Um, and um, and so we get used to talking to each other in, for a period of perhaps three to five minutes and getting a lot of information across. I think people should feel free to ring up no matter what if they're really worried about something and they, they should insist on trying to get through. And most good professionals will, will respond to that. Um, otherwise, I think you can get brief pieces of information across in small periods of time. But if you really want to have a longer chat with someone, I think you just, out of courtesy, need to perhaps just say to them, look, I'd like to talk with you to, for 10 or 15 minutes. Can we find a time to do it? And sometimes that might have to be after hours or something like that. But most people will try to fit in. Meetings between us ourselves are very important but hard to do in, in the private sector. I think, and it would be nice if that, I know the MHPN has tried to facilitate that, but um, they, they work to some extent. Um, 
respecting medico legal governance as a doctor is something that I'd like for people to recognise that we're the ones likely to take the responsibility most severely if something goes wrong. So it's important that we'd like to be kept in the loop of any communications. Um, now, moving to our case, Cassie herself, um, there's lots of things I thought thought about in relation to this uh, young woman. Um, uh, I, wondered, I worried about whether she might have been suicidal in that very first presentation and she didn't turn up for the next uh, uh, session. Um, fortunately she didn't try and suicide but I wondered whether, and that's why I was saying don't only follow what the patient wants, sometimes it, rather than just giving a referral it might have been good to actually Ask, I find asking people directly, have you thought of harming yourself or killing yourself so directly, most people actually answer uh, uh, honestly um, or hesitate so much you, you know that it's a major issue and maybe an early risk assessment could have been useful because we as psychiatrists sometimes get a bit um, frustrated because we're we're asked to step in at the very last minute when a, group, a team of people in the community have been working with someone and they've been getting worse and worse and worse from our perspective and then finally we're asked to uh, sort it all out and often the team members sort of wander off at that point and, and we're left with uh, uh, quite a difficulty. So uh, early, um, uh, even talking to us, uh, the GP talking perhaps if they know us about a case at the early stage can be very useful. Um, I'd, I'd just point out that this girl was uh, probably drinking a lot of alcohol, maybe taking other drugs. They can mask or mimic various types of mental illness. It makes it very difficult. And so to really find out what's going on with a person like this, the team often has to work with the person um, over a few months just as this case illustrated in a way, probably four months altogether or something and finally towards the end the patient seemed to be a bit more engaged at last even though she'd gone downhill a little bit more and so that idea of sticking together really requires quite a lot of glue in the uh, community team but it's, um, it's very exciting really for us to be able to work as teams in the community because we are so flexible in a way, that's the risk in, involved with us but it's also the great advantage that we have the flexibility to to actually follow people over a period of time and if we communicate well enough make quite good assessments. And then finally I just wanted to mention the item 291 assessment which occurred in this case that may be I think where where the, um, the, the psychiatrist comes in at the end and gives an assessment and people don't understand this perhaps quite so much if they're not familiar with the Medicare system but under this system the idea is to get the psychiatrist to give a, uh, an assessment and a management plan for the GP and other community members of the collaboration team to help them with their treatment but for the psychiatrist not to continue following that person. So the GP is the one usually that has to make a decision at some critical point. Do we actually get the psychiatrist only to do an assessment uh, which can involve a further one review um, or do we want the psychiatrist to be involved in the clinical team for some considerable time perhaps. And so that's the disadvantage of the assessment type item. The advantage is that you should get quite a good assessment from a psychiatric point of view and a management plan which shouldn't be just about medication but should be about other ideas uh, in terms of psych psychological management so forth. But uh, it is quite a useful uh, item though because you can get quite quick assessments um, under this item but that you won't get the ongoing management and so people have to decide what sort of role for the psychiatrist they want in the team. Thanks. Thanks very much Bill. And um, just with again clarification around the Medi Medicare issue, in order to um, see the psychiatrist, the referral does have to be actually made by GP. So if the psychologist is the main person working with the patient and realises that they need that, then they, they need to collaborate yeah. with the GP That's for that. Um, now Jan, 
uh, the participants have been making lots and lots of comments in the chat box around the involvement of um, families and carers because the reality is it's actually you guys who are um, looking after Cassie and Cassie herself is looking after Cassie most of the time and she just sees the health professionals occasionally. So it's really, really important that we hear from you um, about what you might be thinking now about for Cassie. Thanks very much. Thanks Mary. Look, um, the families are very often um, a great source of information but this uh, issue of uh, confidentiality and privacy seems to crop up so many times. And it's also sometimes used, I think, um, as an excuse not to engage with carers. But it is a really ethical issue, isn't it? I mean, we heard Louisa talk about the, the ethical issue of um, the father, Cassie's father, and what um, and how much and, and should she um, disclose this in the first place. So um, from, from my perspective, I'm a consumer, um, I feel very strongly about this particular issue of communication and collaboration, collaboration more than anything. When I was at my worst, my sickest, um, I was seeing a GP, I was seeing a psychiatrist, and I was seeing a mental health nurse at a private hospital all in the one week, and that went on for probably 12 to 18 months. So, was I over service? I don't think so. Uh, the, the three people, the three health professionals, kept me alive. So. I have some key messages here up on the screen that I'd, I'd really like you to think very seriously about as a health professional. Collaboration between health professionals is absolutely crucial. I talked to you, I mentioned that I, I was seeing three health professionals in the one way. It was interesting that um, um, I would find myself telling the GP some issue. Um, on perhaps the Wednesday and I'd be seeing the psychiatrist on the, the Friday and telling her something different again. I don't think it's not in my mind that I was playing one off against the other. It was more what had happened in the last day or two that was particularly uppermost in my mind and my concern. Um, so in my mind collaboration between health professionals is crucial. Um, you really do need to know what's going on with your patient um, from a, you know, uh, if you see them weekly or fortnightly or monthly. It is really absolutely crucial that you collaborate. Um, it's interesting, Caroline mentioned um, as a GP um, the real need for her involvement. GPs really are the first port of call, aren't they? And they're certainly a very central port of call. Uh, I certainly emphasise, Caroline, with the, the patient backup that you have to and that, and that GPs have to manage. Nonetheless, um, we often, as a consumer and as a family member, we are often looking at our GP as someone who pulls all of this together. I think the other point I'd like to say is communication must be timely. Um, I talked about my own um, experience. Did I expect communication to happen on a weekly basis? Absolutely not. I guess it would be more that if there was some issue that I was perhaps seen by one of the health professionals as being at risk, um, it was, and I was from time to time, that it was absolutely crucial that that be communicated to others. Um, it's, uh, so communication in my mind is very much up there as well. I think the third point is that all health professionals involved in treatment and care must be fully informed. We talk about Cassie, don't we, and this is perhaps a, a, a good question to lead into the panel members, but what do you do um, if, if, as in my case, that I would tell the GP something, I would tell the psychiatrist something else, um, all impacting on my treatment focus? So I guess that's, uh, that's an issue that I feel very strongly about, that, that all health professionals, particularly around risks, I think, um, more than anything, risks. If one sees a, 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 a patient or a consumer and they are particularly concerned, Bill mentioned that uh, too, if you're particularly concerned, it would be really important to pass that message across. And I think the other issue is around cooperation. Uh, regarding information sharing. 
So um, it's not a matter of, uh, gee, in the pecking order, who comes first and second and third. It's more around uh, who is best managed, who is best placed to manage this information sharing. Um, and I think that's something that really needs to be determined uh, from the outset. I think it's hugely important. And I think from a family perspective too, families um, be quite right. Families are the ones that end up holding um, holding the patient or holding the consumer close to them. So, um, and they do that, but mostly without training and without any sort of specific in, uh, information or education about their task. They don't all wish to have that task. And it's, it's something that's often placed upon them, something that they prefer not to use. So um, I think engaging as best you can with the family is an absolute uh, essential. Uh, I have to say that in my experience, my, my husband was not included and, uh, in any of the discussions. And if I could change something, it would be that, uh, that that a key family member, if it's okay with the consumer and with their permission that they can be included and involved time, and that's something that can be sorted out from the outset. So look, I did, uh, Mary, if I may, there is a, a, a question, I, I touched on it around confidentiality and uh, privacy and information sharing. So it might just be a time to um, sort of open up the panel discussion because I think Absolutely and um, I know you had a specific question about that so please go ahead. Okay, look uh, this is something which um, which involves carers so often, um, you know, what information is shared with them but in this particular issue it's what are the issues around confidentiality and information sharing between health professionals. So the question would be Kathy has disclosed to her GP the information regarding her rape, but refuses to allow others to be notified as she does not wish to revisit the trauma. So for the panel members, and I'm not sure who's best placed or whether you'd all like to have a, a perspective on this because it, it really is crucial um, and very pertinent to families as well. So what are the issues around confidentiality and information sharing between health professionals when patients ask for specific information not to be disclosed to others involved in, in this case, Cathy's care, but would affect the treatment focus? In this case, it was regarding the rape. So I hand so it over, Mary, to... Yeah, I'd really like... I'd like to bring Carolyn back in with that one. Um, in this case, the, the clients disclose the information to the GP. But uh, I think this is actually a situation that, that we all have to manage from time to time. So Carolyn, how, how would you respond to Jan's question? Well, I think um, it, in this particular situation, I would be working hard to make Cassie um, recognise the link between secrecy and um, uh, um, lack of um, treatment opportunity. So I would respect her right to not want to revisit the trauma. I would try and work with her around um, that issue, but also explain to her that you know there are some people with specific expertise dealing with this kind of trauma, and that while I will keep it secret until she's ready to disclose it, I do think that there are certain circumstances where she might find she gets more relief from her distress by disclosing. Um, so we would just talk about it. We would talk about those issues about why it's hard, why it might be hard. And I certainly it's very common in general practice to have um, different levels of disclosure with different people. The hard thing in general practice is how to remember who said what because obviously at some point you have to make a record in the, in the clinical notes about what was discussed. And if you talk to GPs, they'll tell you that they often have cryptic ways of recording things in the notes that remind them that there are sensitive issues but that aren't available for everyone to read. So it is, it is a challenge in a large group practice. Um, but I also think that GPs could do more right at the outset when someone comes in and says they want a referral under better access um, because many people do want that because of, of course it makes um, psychological care or our care with um, social workers and OTs much more affordable. Um, I spent a bit of time explaining to them that I think it's a great idea but the whole purpose of the Better Access Initiative is to permit this kind of collaboration. So while it's absolutely fine to have 
bits of information that she might not be ready to disclose, the actual concept of collaboration is absolutely key to the Better Access program and that it really, um, if people aren't prepared to do that collaboration then, then maybe they need to consider whether the Better Access program is right for them. I mean, I think this happens a lot. It's, it's almost the providers have this conspiracy of silence because it's too hard to have these conversations and explain to patients the importance of collaboration rather than that patients have really been able to think it through. I think patients are often speaking from their emotional distress um, and, and one of our roles as, 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 our, as health professionals is to explain to them that while you hear the distress and you acknowledge it, um, that, that that will have consequences in terms of this kind of system of care. Thank you. Um, Jan, I just took the liberty of moving us forward into the Q&A session because I think you did that beautifully and we'll, we'll probably come back to the questions that you had. So um, I, I wondered if, um, Bill, you would like to comment more about, um, you raised the issue about, about risk and it's come up in the panel as well. So sometimes a piece of information might have an impact on, on the risk. Uh, so yeah, if you could just talk about ha some helpful ways to think about that. Um, yes, I, look, uh, I probably didn't explain myself well enough uh, earlier that um, uh, the, the, I think the GP seeing uh, Cassie at the beginning was in a very difficult situation. She was trying to um, maintain rapport with her and get her on board uh, in terms of being able to work with her. Um, but um, I, was, I was, I guess, pointing out there could have been a risk of suicide in a way, and by just going along with the referral, in some ways, if, she, if the young woman was suicidal, it would be like she wasn't being listened to or that wasn't being um, touched on, and she, she might go out suicidal. Um, um, and so it, it, when someone that seems fairly distressed comes along, and, it, and particularly where they, they feel that um, they, um, it, when you feel that you're not getting very good communication uh, with the person, uh, it might be pretty important to actually try and work out exactly where they are as best you can, even though it's very difficult to communicate. Because um, uh, I guess you know uh, um, uh, that uh, the person could harm themselves if that, that's where they were at that particular time. You're not getting much information. Uh, um, you know, so but that also applies all the way through, I suppose, uh, with someone like this. And uh, I think that um, it's um, uh, it's a matter of keeping that in 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 mind. And I'm sure the the GP in this case was trying to get rapport going so that they could actually get uh, to finding out what they were, the patient was really uh, thinking and feeling in the next session. But unfortunately, they didn't have that. Um, I think the the psychiatrists, when they gave their assessment later in, in the course of the uh, uh, whole process, I, I, don't, we, it's, I don't think it was specifically mentioned, but they should probably also talk a little, a little bit of comment on the, on the chat, in the chat room about um, the, um, also, uh, the, whether, how, how to talk with uh, relatives uh, and carers um, and what the ethics of that are. I think my understanding is that un under privacy law there is an understanding that when you see a health professional they may communicate with other professionals uh, for the patient's good but that the patient should at all times have a, some understanding that that's likely to occur. I think it's always good practice and improves trust if you tell the, the, your client or your patient exactly who you're intending to communicate with and uh, what level of information you're like to, likely to communicate because it does greatly improve trust. But I, I don't think you need necessarily to get written consent and so forth if you keep that degree of openness about it. And uh, there's also been some comments in the chat room about the, uh, the fact that uh, we haven't talked much about the, the rape itself and how to deal with that very sensitive issue. And um, just an initial thought I had about that was that um, people often tell you these things, um, uh, tell a person 
at some point when they're ready to talk, and, and it could be any one of the members of the team. And I, I think it's very important that um, uh, that, that sort of respect that the person's allowed to talk as much for as long as possible in the time that's available um, at that time, because that's a sort of a special communication, and then it's important to try to work out where to go with that information, but not necessarily make big um, decisions about whether to go to the police straight away and so forth, but to make another appointment if necessary and see if the person, say, for instance, I'm a male therapist, whether they would feel more comfortable to be able to talk further as well with a female therapist or something like that. Um, uh, but to show that you're not afraid of hearing and listening listening to what the person's saying and being willing, I think, very important in in, uh, in this sort of situation. And probably not to tell uh, or encourage them straight away to talk either with the family about it, but to give them enough sessions to talk about it, to see whether they feel that they could talk about it with the family. Because you might not know, for instance, whether the father, if he knew what had happened, he'd go out and try and bash up the, the, the ex-boyfriend or something, and, and that wouldn't help the situation in any way, shape, or form, probably. You know, so you, you have to know more about the, the whole situation before you make suggestions about going straight to the police. Look, what kind of things? <laughs> yeah, no, look, I suppose I, I particularly, ha when you probably, as a psychologist, perhaps being the person that may be providing the, the therapy and seeing the, the person more often, I guess there's situations where you do hear pieces of information which, which um, people don't want you to share with others. So in a practical sense, how do you work sure. with that? Yeah, thank practical you. Tips. Thank you. Um, yeah, look, I guess I'm... It is really tricky because we are often um, we often are trying to balance between um, building that rapport and building that trust, um, but also knowing that um, there might be um, there might be things that might help them um, if we are able to um, you know to collaborate. I guess with other members of the team. I, I guess when I was hearing Bill, I was thinking to myself, I really I like that approach of. Um, you know, not panicking, um, being able to take it slowly, um, and, and I guess I'm also thinking it, it's tricky if we're talking about communicating and collaborating. That that sort of thing that I can just find so um, so fantastic about being able to collaborate that you can kind of have another conversation, have a conversation with another one of the team, like Bill, who can say, "Okay, Louisa, look, you know, yep, this is what they've disclosed here. This is what's happening. That's okay. I think just give them the space to talk about it." Um, yep, you're right, your theory about doing X, Y and Z does make sense, but perhaps they just need that time. And I think that that can be really helpful um, for psychologists to sort of um, um, have that bit of support, I guess. So that, yeah, that was what I was thinking. Thank you. And I, I guess um, I'm, I'm just going to frame a question for Jan, but it's possibly I could have asked you. So Jan, um, I think one of the realities is our mental health professionals network panels always have uh, holistic, um, reflect, reflective, uh, confident, highly confident practitioners on them. The reality is that there are uh, many practitioners who, for whom mental health is just a small part of what they do and a lot of GPs who maybe don't have a lot of expertise or don't have time or don't know much about trauma or all sorts of things. And the reality is as, as consumers and carers, you just have to see whoever you can see. And they might not even understand the way that the mental health treatment plan system works or that it in, involves collaboration. Or So what kind of advice do you have for us from the, from the consumer carer perspective about working with clinicians who um, maybe are not interested in collaboration? <laughs> well, um, that's an interesting point, Mary. Um, I, I would hope that's not the case, to be honest. Because um, as I said, I think collaboration is the key to good 
holistic mental health uh, treatment and care, really. Um, look, it is interesting, isn't it? Bill touched on the fact that perhaps in this case, Cassie might prefer to, to speak to a female psychiatrist or other health professional about the issue of trauma. You're quite right. Also, I'm in South Australia, and I understand it's the same in Victoria, that um, many private psychiatrist books are, are closed. They're not taking new patients. Um, I think the Better Access has been fabulous, and the ATAP program has been fabulous, but more particularly the Better Access to enable us to access uh, psychologists, mental health nurses, and other allied health professionals. Um, and I think that has opened up for many the opportunity of being able to perhaps uh, choose what sort of um, health professional fits best for us, for our uh, respective issues. Um, and as I said, that may be a female, it may not be. To be able to have that flexibility would be wonderful, but I'm not sure that the Australian healthcare system really allows very much for that. Um, and I think also we can choose. We can choose our GPs. We can choose um, to see whom we wish. Um, so I think that is uh, that's a major issue in terms of health professionals choosing not to collaborate. I think that would be um, almost a, a, a lack of duty of care. Um, I think it's absolutely essential that if you're treating someone, particularly for a mental health problem, that it is it really is it comes with the territory. I think that collaboration has to be right up there, probably more than anything, probably more important than cooperation. So um, you know, I think um, it would be my my advice would be from our perspective is to is to involve as many as you can. In, in treating the, the individual in a more uh, greater holistic type care as you possibly can, and also not leaving out the family. So I think the family members, wherever possible, and again, if, if Cassie chose not to have her family involved, which she has, um, I think it would be something that um, I would want to see from a, a, a parent's perspective that that be explored a bit with Cassie to, to perhaps come to a point where she might be willing to, to allow you as a health professional to engage in some way with, with, um, with the family member, with the mum or with the dad. So um, yeah, collaboration in my mind between health professionals is crucial. So you might encourage Cassie or Cassie's parents parents to, to vote with their feet really and look for someone that, that they feel can work in that, that way. Yeah. Um, Jen, really trust, yeah. trust is, is, in, is the basis, isn't it, for a really good therapeutic relationship. And I think that's the key. Um, you know, we don't, we're not all attracted to each other and as, as, um, as a consumer you're not necessarily attracted to a particular health professional. And it's nothing personal, it's just one of those clinical things that uh, happens, isn't it? So I, I think it's absolutely crucial. And, and it's, it's, you know, just because someone chooses to move away from you as a health professional isn't, um, isn't saying that you lack expertise. It's a matter of saying, look, what fits best for me um, and what fits best for your patient or your, the consumer that you're treating. Thank you. Now, um, I I wonder, you had raised a question and I think I might address it to Carolyn. So let's say somebody in the treating team or perhaps the family with the question you raised has become aware that Cathy started to harm herself. Um, so how I think I might ask Carolyn this. Uh, how, how would we know or how would the family know who is the best practitioner to contact or, or who, who they should raise their concerns with? Well, I think the reality is, in most occasions, um, people would start with the GP, whether they were the best person or not, because, you know, as we've seen from this case study, it's highly unlikely that um, the family have been involved enough to know where else to start. Um, I think the advantage of um, involving the GP is that it's um, it's local and, and close by, and 
obviously if there is physical issues related to self-harm, they can be addressed there as well. Um, but I, I mean, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. I think in an ideal world, we would have you know developed a shared care plan um, where we would have agreed who does which bit of 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 those kind of you know dealing with those issues. And if anyone's ever re read a mental health treatment plan template, there is a little box that says emergency and crisis care. Now in my practice, um, if I get enough time to do a mental health plan properly, I always say to people, well, there's a box here we have to fill in which talks about emergency and crisis care. So let's talk about some of the things that hopefully won't happen but might happen. Um, and then I explain that even if you don't need this information, it might be useful for you in the future. Here are the steps of care you get if something goes wrong, like you know, if if you feel like that you might harm yourself, or if you become so distressed that you can't function, or um, you know, if you're if you're becoming more unwell, or you're worried about another family member, so we go through and it's almost like a little brief hypothetical discussion, and then I run through a hierarchy of crisis care and say to the patient, "Do you understand these steps, and how do you feel about them?" And sometimes they'll say, "Well, I'll never call Lifeline, or I would never call the CAT team, but I would call you." And I okay, okay, well, I'm only in the practice three days a week, so if I'm not there, what would you do then? And we actually do a little rehearsal of these kind of issues. Now that only takes about five minutes, but you know, and it's in the mental health plan as one of the requirements of a mental health plan. But I guess you know, it, it can only happen if you make space for that, and you actually say, "Here are some of the steps that are important." And that's certainly what I would do with my. And there's also, of course, a box on the mental health plan. And which says who's your carer or key support. And at that point, I don't just fill in whoever's listed as next of kin in the history. I say to the patient, okay, this box is where we actually agree who would I call if I was really worried about you and you weren't able to um, um, look after yourself. So you know, if you came in here and you were so distressed that we, we just didn't even think you could walk home. And I find, if I phrase it like that, nine times out of ten, Patients do nominate someone. They say, "Look, I am happy in that circumstance for you to call this person." And I say, "Okay, so are you going to tell this person that you've nominated them because it's an important task you're giving them? They may never be needed, but it would be great to talk to them about it at some stage." So again, I'm just, you know, facilitating this idea that you need a plan. It's not a referral; it's a plan. And in this plan, we have steps for dealing with crisis, like self harm, and we also have a plan that we've discussed in advance about who in the family or the team of carers or support people would you involve? Oh, but it's, it's a wonderful question to ask because it often opens up wonderful discussion, for example, like, well, um, I'd put my husband down as my main carer because he's my next of kin, but I get more support from my sister. So I say, okay, well, let's put both those names down and let's talk about how you're going to engage each of them in helping you so that if something does go wrong, you know, they're there to help you, not to make it harder for you. And I think those little extra conversations can make a huge difference to some of these kind of issues. Um, but ultimately, I would hope if I've done a plan like that, the patient would know to come back to the general practice. And in my practice, I'm very lucky if I'm not there, not only do I, I nominate another GP who's there on the days I'm not there that I often introduce the patient to. So, so if I'm not here on this day, you could see this doctor because I think you've met them before or they're nice or whatever, I actually introduce them or I involve the mental health nurse in our practice. So I say I'd like you to see the mental health nurse in our practice so that if a crisis arises, um, given that we know that the CAT team is really only for people who are you know, in extreme crisis and there's a whole lot of less severe crises, um, here's our mental health nurse and I'd like you to meet them because they could also help in those situations. That's really helpful, Carolyn. I can see that the uh, participants are really Finding that useful, so you're using the mental health treatment plan process as an actual planning around collaboration. So for the the, the person, their family and carers, and also you mentioned earlier about agreement that that you will be collaborating with the psychologist and so on. So I think that's really helpful. Um, I'm mindful of the time, so we're, we're beginning to come to a close. Um, I forgot to say at the beginning that participants, once we um close, it would be great if you could online and complete the exit survey because we do listen to your feedback. One of my favourite comments for the evening is that we all should have the NBN. So thank you for whoever said that. Um, the Redback platform is fantastic but it sometimes is limited by the technology. Now um, I would like to invite um, Louisa back in. Louisa, there's been some really specific questions around um, as GPs or even as, as 
families and carers and patients. And how, how, how do we know what a counsellor, whether it's a psychologist or other kinds of counsellors, what their special interests are, what their skills are, how do we know who to pick to refer to? In this case, the GP just had to look the person up in the phone book. But yeah. could you just give us a couple of little tips around that and then just some final comments for us? Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a really, really great question. And I guess the the thing that I do um, professionally is that I work really hard at building relationships with um, local GPs in my area so they know me um, and they know what it is that I do and what my special interests are. Um, I have a good website so I try to make it as easy as possible um, for people to find that out about me. I think really the only way is to have um, to have those good relationships. Um, the APS have a find a referral service, um, which is great, but um, as a lot of people will know, the downside is that psychologists um, are able to self-nominate, I think it's like up to 15 different areas or something like that. So there's often can be a bit overwhelming and you're not really sure what's actually a real specialisation or just an interest area. And that's often something that family members and clients themselves, they're wanting to find the expert in a particular area, so that can be a downside of that service. Um, yeah, but I would say the main thing is just about having those relationships. I don't think that there's any way around that. Um, I think the other thing that you asked me, Mary, was to make some closing comments. Is that right? Yes, please. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, look, I guess um, just off the top of my head, I'm, I'm so passionate about collaboration and I just don't see how we can give a really um, good psychological service without, um, without all the different professionals being on the, on the same page. And I think that um, you know, it, it's hard because not all professionals, not all other, I guess the doctors and the psychiatrists aren't necessarily always uh, you know, wanting to talk to us. And we do sometimes as psychologists, I know I certainly do get um, the feeling with some of them that you know, they don't have time and they just do want us to fix it. And I guess I, I just don't let that stop me. Um, and um, I, I will um, maybe not keep pushing with that particular person, but I don't let it get in the way of me um, taking that risk and picking up the phone to another GP and trying to collaborate with them. And um, you know, there's just been too far too many occasions where I've found um, a doctor to be so thankful that I've shared a particular insight um, with them, and that makes it worth it. I just it's just so important. Don't be afraid. Thank you very much, Louisa. Um, Bill, I'd like to just invite you back in. As you've been listening, have there been any sort of final comments that you'd like to leave us with? Yeah, look, um, I think uh, we're, we're sometimes hard to get a hold of. I think, though, if you have very good, um, as psychiatrist, if you, if you have very good uh, feelings about the collaboration you've done with particular um, people in the community, you tend to want to come back to them you, you'll uh, and work with them on with other uh, patients and clients so that we can that that's the thing that often will, will get us more involved with people in the community when we've had, had that good experience and uh, it does take time as I say the other thing I just mentioned is that the, the, there was quite a lot of commentary in the uh, chat room about uh, how to deal with the families and another thought is that the family in this case was distressed too and it, it is quite appropriate for another uh, a therapist, either within the general practice or outside, to see if the family would like to engage with them to try and work out what they can do in this difficult situation. I think it's helpful if there can be potentially communication between that, that therapist and the other team under very careful and specific circumstances. But sometimes I've certainly been in that position of working with the family, with the carer and helping the carer find a different strategy that works better and being able to tell from what's happening that that's helping with the therapeutic process that's occurring with some other people and, and that can actually be a very valuable way of helping deal with the family distress. Thanks Bill. So again, the kind of complexity with the people that many of us are seeing, it's so important to not be trying to handle this alone. But family and carers and the, t the treating team. So thanks very much for that. Um, Caroline, have you got any sort of uh, parting messages for us? I guess just to remember that we're hopefully all on the same side. We all are aiming to get the best outcome for people that come to us seeking care. So 
So I guess it's important, particularly for private practitioners, to remember that teamwork also requires us to sometimes pass on care, not to hold on to care if someone's been attending the same person for care for a long time and not really changing, nothing's improving. It's a great idea to get a second opinion, even if you want to keep caring for that person, just to say, um, you know, I would have hoped things are better than they are now and, and why don't we get some extra help in? And people need to know that you care about them but also that you're not going to hold on to them. I find this is a problem for me as a GP that people sometimes come and say, look, I'm seeing this person, they're not really helping but I don't really know how to get out of this therapeutic relationship. And um, you know, I, I always feel sad that they haven't been able to have that conversation um, and I guess in a way better access because it requires us to try and solve problems within a limited number of sessions, annoying as that is, it does really force us to ask that question of, well, is this the best therapy? Is the person really getting what they, you know, that, that they really need at this point in time and being prepared to, to pass care on or at least share care? Yeah. Thank you. Now, um, Jan, I deliberately left you to have the final say. I think that um, you'll probably have some really valuable comments for us and uh, yeah, so please. Thanks Mary. Um, look, I think there are two points that I'd like to make. Firstly, I think questions, um, asking questions as a health professional are really the key. From many people I'm sure that you work with, particularly with very personal, very private issues around abuse or rape. Um, find it very hard to actually open up, it's certainly not until that, that trusting therapeutic relationship has been um, formed, but I would encourage that you, you gently question uh, or put gentle questions to, to the, your patient or your, the consumer that you're treating. And Caroline also mentioned on it, uh, touched on it um, when dealing with the family, you know, uh, very often we find uh, just the word carer. If someone said to you, or, or you said to someone, um, who is your carer? They'd say, what are you talking about? I have a husband, I have a wife, so it's my mum, it's my, my daughter, my son. So it's probably you know, better to say, well, who helps you the most with your banking or your you know, day to day issues? Um, so that's, a, that's the first point. The second point that I'd really like to, to talk, um, touch on briefly is um, is working as a team. I think collaboration means exactly that, that you are working as a team. Um, but I'd be very concerned that if you felt <coughs> that uh, Cassie was seeing you know, a couple of people that um, that other person has, that other health professional has picked up a particular point or a particular issue. So I think working as a team is an absolutely fantastic approach. Um, and that the consumer or your patient receives the best possible care when people are working as a team. My main concern is that that um, you may think, well, this has been picked up by somebody else. Uh, it's not that important. I won't worry about it. So working as a team is absolutely crucial. But please don't let something slip through that you would um, you would think is important at a later date. Thanks so much, Jan. I just wanted to say thank you um, to the participants as well for your contributions. We've had over, over 400 people on board tonight. And um, I've, I've noticed that the participants have been really um, pleased with the way that the panel has kept in touch and answered their questions. Uh, an interesting thing tonight, I think the panel's really stuck to the topic of collaboration and the participants have actually dealt with some of the nitty gritty of the case and I think that's been a lovely process. So just in Summary, I think one of the key messages that, um, that certainly stood out for me was about, about planning to collaborate from the beginning and actually talking about that with the client. So wherever they come through, whether they come to the psychologist first or they talk to their family or they go to their GP, um, that this communication and working together and having, I like to think about, you know, as having some people on your side or in your corner. So the more people we can have on the team to help you, this gives us a whole lot more power. Um, and also the importance of actually developing relationships with those training teams, working out how to communicate. And it seems to be about planning and practical things, trying to predict in advance what might be necessary. So thank you everybody for a really interesting panel discussion. Please make sure you complete the exit survey before you log out. 
um, and it will appear on the screen after the session closes. Um, you will be issued with a certificate of attendance in a few weeks and you'll also be sent a link to the resources that have been discussed, probably including ones that, that the uh, participants have brought into the chat box. And the next uh, webinar that MHPN are hosting is working together to support a child with autistic spectrum disorder, apologies, autism spectrum disorder, experiencing sleep disturbance. And that's going to be on Monday the 5th of May. The address is there if you'd like to register. And I would also like to once again thank the Private Mental Health Alliance for partnering with MHPN to bring this webinar um, to us. And uh, thanks very much and good night everybody.